As other families welcome their child to the world, mine did too, but in a different way. There was happiness and excitement on one hand, but also anxiety and thoughts about how to survive the shooting and bombing during the civil war in Sri Lanka. A war which claimed over 100,000 lives. My father was belonged them. My mother was left by herself with my two elder brothers and me. I was eight, my brothers nine and 12. I still remember the constant fear of bombing. You were not safe, not even in schools and hospitals. One day, I remember coming home from school and getting ready for dinner with my family. Suddenly, my mother ran in, grabbed our hands, and pushed us into the bunkers. An area of 15 square meters, with 15 to 20 people hoping they would not drop any bombs today. You could hear babies crying, see elders being squeezed, and pregnant women suffering. The war did not give us any other options than to leave the country in hope for a better life in Europe. We were some of the luckiest. On Christmas Eve in 2001, my mother and I came to Norway as refugees, to an unknown country. Everything from language to food was different. And our feelings were mixed. Nonetheless, we were glad to have come to a safe country. After many years, it was possible to get a good night of sleep without waking up every hour to check if everyone was alive. But at the same time, it was cruel losing my father at the age of eight. Horrible not to be able to grow up together with my siblings. We were first placed at Lysakar refugee camp. My mother and I were placed in a room with eight bunk beds. We shared one bed on the top. I still remember the pain I felt during that time. It was a feeling of emptiness, a feeling of not belonging anywhere. Even if I had my mother, I felt alone and scared. Every night when we went to bed, I used to hold my mother's hand by very firmly in case she would leave me during the night. I was terrified because my loved ones leave me or that I would have to leave them for some reason. After some months at Lysaka refugee camp, we had to move to Bergen because of the settlement program for refugees in Norway. Years flew by and my brothers came to Norway through family reunification, and we were finally united. But as years passed, I, I started to realize how lucky I was to get a life here in Norway. When I saw around the world, I could see people who were in the same situation as I was just in a few years earlier. People desperately seeking for help. I could feel the pain. I could not just sit and watch. So I was very convinced about changing the world into a better place. I was going to create UN resolutions for the Security Council. Yes, that was the plan. But over the years, I understood one thing through my experience, that you don't need to create resolutions or change the system to actually make a difference. 
All you need to do is to be a human being and to look at those in need as actual human beings. I'm not saying that the resolutions do not have an effect, but we have this intellectual mindset which tells us that you know, changes in a society comes from the government or intergovernmental organizations, but no. It does not have to be. Because when I was a refugee in this country, it was not the huge change in the system or UN resolutions which shaped me into the person I am today. I will tell you, as a result of the people I met, their intentional and non-intentional contributions which helped me to be here today. I remember my first day at Norwegian primary school as if it were yesterday. I went to find my class and quickly understood that I was the only different person there. Yeah. I did notice that they were looking at me, but I was staring at my desk. The first days were difficult, but as days passed, my classmates asked if I wanted to play with them. And the games they were playing was different from the ones I was used to, but they taught me how to play them. We could not understand each other, but yet we managed to play together. And during one of the lessons, the teacher gave us exercises. And as we started working on them, I needed help from the teacher. But in my home country, you do not use the name of the teacher to ask for help. So I wasn't sure how to reach out. But one of my friends, Malin, understood that I needed help and called the teacher for me. And since that day, she did always sit beside me during the classes. I felt safe and comfortable. And as time passed, my uh, friend Malin invited me home to her. And it was first there I started to understand the Norwegian family culture, about the food and the beautiful personality people here have to treat everyone regardless of your race, lifestyle and position. And I would thank Malin and her parents for giving me a chance to integrate in this society. She does not know that I would today, 15 years later, mention her influence in my life journey. A selfless contribution which has helped me during the most vulnerable time in a new country. And it did not cost her anything but yet a huge impact on me. And my story, and during our time at the refugee camp, there has been a lot of volunteers from the Norwegian Red Cross who came to visit us at the reception center for asylum seekers. And we together exchanged our culture through food, dance, and other activities. The volunteers were all from the age of 16 to 70 years old, and they did not have any idea about our background, but yet they were there and showed compassion for the situation we were in. So my story as a refugee in this country and the situation in the world today led to my trip to Becca Valley, Lebanon on 6th of April. I, my first day started in the field with an assessment program through an NGO called Salam. I came to a world where I saw people sleeping on streets, garages, camps without basic needs. Children sleeping on floor without mattresses, blankets, clothing and shoes. I saw a generation of children who did not receive any education. I saw children who die of cold. 
On February this year, a mother lost her three-month-old daughter in one of the settlements. She died of carbon monoxide poisoning. In the bitter cold, the mother has fired full power in the fireplace. Coal was laid on for the heat to last longer during the night. But she did not know the mother who only tried to protect her daughter from the cold, that she would die as a result of the poisoning. And this is the world today. As I'm standing here and talking to you, this is 2017. I would kindly like to ask each and one of you to see these refugees as human beings, as they are. These are people who have been forced to leave their homes, to leave their family. People just like us, who hope and wish for a normal life in a safe country. Please, don't place them in the so-called refugees' tech and leave them there. I ask you to be the Marlin in someone else's life. To be Marlin's parents in someone else's life. To be the volunteers in someone else's life. I ask you to see them as human beings and not as numbers and statistics. You may not change the world, but you will change the world for someone as these people who changed mine. Thank you.